Welcome to the Once in Future Authors Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and I'm so delighted to be joined today by author Linda Maria Frank. Linda has written a huge number of books. I mean, I can't even keep track. But uh, her latest, The Buccaneers of St. Frederick Island, uh, a little bird told me one of her favorites, which is uh, something really big for an author to admit. And I am so thrilled to be joined by Linda, not just for her writing, but for her insights on the book industry, readers. Uh, she is a author, uh, show host herself. So she's got some fabulous insights. Linda, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. I am thrilled. And, and I, I teased Linda a second ago. I had to quick hit record because we were saying all the best stuff before we even started the show. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it's before, always that way. Exactly. Before we get to all of that, how did you get your start in writing? You've written so much. This is this is strange because to me it's strange because I, when I was my worst grades in school we went to the same high school by the way yes we did um, <laughs> my worst grades were English I never liked to write um, and then I, I when I was teaching I started to write these little things about the kids in my class and I would post them on the bulletin board I would call it the chemist of the month. And I would write this little biography and, and it was like humorous. And then um, I taught forensic science and I love mysteries. So forensic science, there's, you know, before we were talking about uh, formula books and it's, you know, the same plot all the time. But with forensic science, you can change what kind of evidence there is, what kind of case there is. So what I started to do was to write case studies for my kids instead of having just lecture notes and stuff like that. What I did was I would present them with a mystery story and ask them to solve it. And then we would end up with a court case in the classroom. They had to set up a crime scene. They had to find expert witnesses. And, and we had a la law and order. We had this wonderful court scene. So I was sitting in the library. I had library duty. Um, the angels were good to me and I had library duty. And I was sitting here working on one of these case studies. And I said, you know, I could write a book, I could make this into a book and it would be probably like a Nancy Drew on steroids because there's a lot of science in my books and also history. And um, Nancy, as I remember Nancy Drew, because Nancy Drew, I owe her a huge debt because she made me a lifetime reader because I didn't like to read either. I was a tree climber, a bike rider, you know, that stuff. <laughs> and um, but I was also a good student. So that's how, that was my aha moment, was sitting in the library. I think it was snowing outside. So it was like cozy. And I'm looking at this case study. It was all about art forgery. And that, that's a topic I love in forensic science. In fact, I do a lecture on it. And um, that was it. That's how I got started. I love that. I do have to rewind you for a moment because yes, we did go to the same high school and, and probably both didn't do very, very well in English class. Who was your English teacher? I don't remember their names. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if you had Sister Grace Avila because I had Sister Grace Avila and I would expect she's been around for since the dawn of time. <laughs> no, I, I had, um, I can't remember her name, but she was, I loved her because she read to us. Oh. She was very unusual. She was like a Emily Dickinson type. She was- Oh, a, really? A very very quiet and shy and she said you know if you have to sneeze you should actually go into the ladies room and into one of the booths and sneeze in there <laughs> okay sister well, of course if that happened we might never have had COVID so hey yeah, no, no. <laughs> but, but she, she was a really good teacher and then I had um, a lay teacher who was probably not there by the time you got there um, she had white hair. I believe she was an albino woman and she had no classroom control whatsoever. Oh boy. So, so I tried, that was my lowest mark ever. I tried to sit in the front and listen to her, but I, I had no idea what she was talking about. And all of this gave birth to, how many books do you have now that you've written? Um, I actually have I, seven, if you count them all. There's four Annie Tilleries and then I took two of the Annie Tilleries and I made them into teacher guidebooks. So at the end of each chapter, I wrote author's notes, how I, you know, how I created that character, I expanded the character, 
why I put the science in, blah, 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 all his exactly. notes. And then I like that, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> well, after your aha moment, I should make a book out of this. Was it harder or easier than you expected to, to be? Writing, well, what I did was I, I had no idea how to write a book. I mean, I could, you know, look at a book because I was an avid reader, but I really didn't. I said to myself, let's do this the correct way. So I took a, a course in novel writing mm -hmm. and um, I wrote the first book, which was um, The Madonna Ghost. And uh, then I took a, the advanced novel writing and I wrote the second one. And the woman who was my mentor, this was like, uh, you know, it was in the mail thing. This was before computer, you know, sending things back and forth by email. And the mentor said, you know, these are good. You could sell them. But it took me seven years. She was a successful writer. Seven years to to publish this first book. And it's like seven years, you know. And of course, that was years ago when I should have just started writing those letters. But I didn't. And then a friend of mine um, self-published because she had the same idea I, I did. I'm too old to wait to be discovered. And she she told me because I thought self self-publishing was vanity press. And she said, no, this is different. And uh, so she introduced me to this company right. uh, whose name I shall not mention. And uh, I said, this is a good deal. And, you know, they edited it. And I felt like the book was a quality piece. I felt like they took all of my, you know, they did an editorial review. They told me what was wrong with the book and uh, I fixed it and, and they fixed it. And I felt that it was a good product. So that's how I got started. But um, if anybody asks me how much work goes into writing a book, um, it's a lot. It's a lot. The writing part, once you go into the zone, you know, once you can can just close your eyes to everything that's going on around you and get into that zone, it's really fun. It's really fun. Uh, but um, the publishing is, you know, it, it, it's hard work. Yeah. Um, and then the marketing is is just such a challenge. But but tell me about the first time you got to hold the book in your hand. Oh, it's like having a baby. <laughs> you know, oh, my book. Look at my book. You know, and then I had a friend who um, um, she always claims that she she got me started in all this. And it drives me crazy when she says it, because, you know, she she just points. Well, they're having a book fair over there. So go, you know, and, and it's I said, oh, work that I did and you got me started but anyway that's a, just another story <laughs> it was like a book fair and and I I went and the young lady who was running it was a very charming high school senior at Locust Valley High School and that was my first event and I sold 14 books and I said holy cow this is it I've been made I've been discovered <laughs> <laughs> and I actually had her on my show because she wrote a book she wrote really? a teenage romance book it was very cute oh and, fantastic uh, yeah so <laughs> a lot of what you do is contacts absolutely absolutely networking and you get to meet readers how does it feel to meet people who've read the book has has anyone ever said anything surprising to you like um no no mo mostly uh i get the best now i write for room for young readers right. and i get the best reviews from adults really yeah uh, i i mean i just got a review for buccaneers and the first sentence of the review is i loved this book you know, I have, a, I get a lot of, I love this book because I think what happens with adults is they are transported back to a simpler time, mm. um, to a time when they were reading Nancy Drew or Judy Bolton or Tracy Belden or whoever else. Um, and, and it's that, because there was a, an article in the New York Times a number of years ago when I was first publishing saying how adult women are really turning to young adult literature because it's comforting, you know, this. <laughs> and, and so those are the best reviews. Um, I get good reviews from kids too. I've done classes where they've read the books and whatnot. And um, basically if I get a bad review from a kid, it's because they don't like mysteries or the book scared them. Really interesting. Yeah. And I would think that you would get fabulous reviews from teachers 
as, as a teacher myself, I love your books and love what you put in there to make it so much easier for a teacher-led discussion. Yeah, well, that, yeah, teachers do. I, I forgot about teachers. I don't know how I taught for how many. <laughs> yeah, the te teachers like the books. And uh, I'd like to get more teachers to read them. But what's happening now in education is uh, I, I uh, supervise student teachers for a short period of time at the end of my career. And what I saw was that um, we have very good schools on Long Island. But they are now tending because of all of the pressure from um, the state, from the federal government to achieve certain standards and goals. They all use Common Core. Common Core, I, I, I love the document. I think it's a, a great document and it's a great way to teach. But what the school districts are trying to do is that in each, um, in each department, if you are teaching American history, for instance, everyone has to be on the same topic on the same day. If there's four teachers teaching American history, they all have to be doing the same thing on the same day, more or less. And as a teacher, what I loved was closing the door and doing it my way. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, and you know, they all passed the, re well, most of them passed the regents at the end of the year. So I must've been doing something okay. Right. So uh, I, I found that disheartening. And so how does that affect my books? Well. I'm beginning to think that um, they're having, uh, and I don't know this, but I'm guessing that they're having department meetings and they're, they're agreeing on a way to teach something. So if you say, you could take my book and you could actually teach this, this, and this, because I put history in my books and I put science in my books. And you could use that as a jumping off point to a particular topic. Um, uh, so I don't know. I don't but there's know. no room for it in a curriculum that's that strict. Mm -hmm. and. It's not even a matter then of one teacher, for example, um, coming upon your book and saying, oh, I'd love to have this in my classroom. It has to actually go through more like a departmental hoop. Yeah. So, well, but whatever. So I, I mean, I, I belong to Long Island children's, children's writers and illustrators. So we do book fairs in schools. And of course, I always donate a set of my books to the library there. And right. uh, sometimes they invite you for a reading. And sometimes because of whatever is happening in those classrooms, uh, they will use the books. Like if the teacher who's teaching the English, you know, because basically my books are in fifth through eighth grade, maybe. Right. And so if they're um, in junior high, they have the teams and there's a teacher who teaches English and social studies, and then there's a science math person. Mm -hmm. So uh, the English teacher is covering mysteries, for instance, then they'll do the book. So yeah, it's, it's more complicated than people think. It is, it is. Getting into the schools is, is definitely much more complicated than people think. But rewinding back to how do you get these actual ideas for books? You know, so many people come to me and say, I'd love to write, but I have no ideas. What inspires you? Okay, so I have too many ideas, but, <laughs> but you know, it brings me to the question of what is a writer? Mm. A writer is a person, whether you're writing nonfiction or fiction, who wishes to share. Unless you're the secret writer who has the diary and never shows it to anybody till you're dead. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the writer who wishes to share. So for nonfiction, you're wishing to share uh, information, uh, how to fix things, uh, history, real history, real science, because you think it's going to have an impact on people's thinking and possibly change the way people think or inform them. For fiction, what you're trying to share, you're a storyteller. Okay, so you want to tell a story. So if this person says to you, I want to write, but I have no ideas, don't you have a life? What happened in your life? What's the most interesting thing that you've ever come across in your life? Okay, so those are the ideas. I mean, read the newspaper, as in something in, watch television. Aren't there stories that grab you? Wouldn't you like to make up a story about that? I mean, for me, it's easy because, I, you know, it's like law and order ripped from the headlines. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a, a topic that I love in forensic science, like art 
forgery. And I'll write a story about uh, what I wove into, this is Girl with Pencil Drawing. And the inspiration for that book, the title anyway, was I was in the Museum of, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And there's a picture in there of a girl looking out the window and drawing. And I, I just called it Girl with Pencil Drawing. Uh, <laughs> That's where the title came from. But in that book, um, my heroine uh, actually comes across a uh, ring of art forgers. And these people uh, are willing to kill you if you, you know, try to expose what they're doing. But it, it revolves around the Brooklyn Bridge and a, and a brownstone in Brooklyn. And it goes back in history to a story in World War II where the woman who started this art institute in New York, where my main character is taking art lessons, she was a nurse, a Czechoslovakian nurse during World War II. And um, she fell in love with an American soldier. And he was going back to America to his wife. And, but he, he gave her two paintings that he actually confiscated. Because during World War II, um, the monuments men were not supposed to take any of these art pieces. They were supposed to give them back to, you know, get them back to where they belong. But he gives her these two paintings and he says, you're going to need money. And when you need it, you can sell this. Wow. So, so I'm weaving all this stuff about, <clears throat> excuse me, how you paint a portrait, um, um, all, all about uh, how you authenticate an art piece. And then I go back in history to uh, the biggest art crime that ever happened, which is what the Nazis did right. in confiscating art from the Jews. So there's all of that in that book. And meanwhile, I mean, these kids are, are running away from, from somebody who's trying to kill them throughout the whole book. And the end of the book has a really, I mean, the end of the book is to me very exciting. It's, it's really, uh, <gasps> now, so. as you're thinking about a book in the planning stages and the idea stages, are you thinking in terms of, is this marketable? Will people like it? Or is that a separate, are you artistic and marketable or is it a combination? It, it's, it's both things. I mean, I'm writing what I love to write. I, you can't write what you don't want to. I mean, I can't, I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, trained or professional enough to crank out something I don't like. But at the same time, I'm thinking, what can I do about Annie Tillery? What can, what can, how can I make Annie Tillery lovable? You, your characters have to be lovable. I mean, that's how a series really moves, moves along, is that you want to find out, is, you know, is Annie going to ever talk to her mother again? Uh, you know, is, is Annie going to fall in love with Ty? Is Ty going to continue to love Annie? Is Annie going to, uh, you know, be an honest person? Is she, you know, is she, is she going to grow? And so I think about that with, with my characters more than anything. I mean, I think the, the stories are all, they're pretty good. They're, they're kind of tried into mystery plots and whatnot. Right. Um, but to the two things that I really love to work with is the characters. I try to make her as lovable as all the characters. I try to make them interesting. I think that's why I like Buccaneers. I, li I like all the characters. Um, and the other thing that, I, that I'm wound up in is setting. I'm very interested. In fact, when people say to me, uh, how do you deal with writer's, uh, writer's block? And I say, think of your setting research your setting because once you even if you set your romance novel in this little tiny town find a little tiny town in 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 i don't know in the united states or wherever that you wanted to set this story in and research it find out the history of it and you'll probably come up with all kinds of interesting ideas and side plots to move you along that that's a great piece of advice for people with writer's block is you know Focus on something. Don't just sit there. And I can't think of anything to write, but dive in and research. Re research is very important yeah. in writing. I mean, you can you can read a romance novel. You can read um, Daniel Steele, okay? But Daniel Steele has done research because every one of her books takes place someplace different, and it's the setting is different. The idea behind the romance is different. Uh, you know, she's dressing up the romance with, uh, it's like dressing a Christmas tree, really. Right. 
And, uh, and I think that that's what makes a book appealing to me. I, you know, I, I don't just really want to read about the character's feelings. I want to read about where they live, what they've been doing, what their family was involved in. That makes the book interesting to me. I mean, some people just, you know, want, want a simple uh, plot or uh, a simple evolution of a character. But uh, I like it all. You know? <laughs> I like that. And, and not only, I think, do readers want it all, but it's a great way to keep you moving ahead when you're stuck is so many people forget that fiction involves research. They think that nonfiction involves research. No, fiction involves research also. Your most interesting books are, you know, just look at what's, um, the last book that my book club did was Unsheltered by Barbara Kingsolver. Mm -hmm. And, um, Barbara Kingsolver is a writer who is very interested in the environment. And part of this book takes place, the book takes place in 1870, and it also takes place in the present. And it deals with aspects of society that are unsheltered. One or two of them is good, the rest of them are all bad. But in order to write this book, she, because what, what happens in 1870 is your main characters live in the same house as the modern people. Um, and the house has problems. But the, there's a teacher living in that house and he wants to teach science. And his principal is completely against, he's, he's, he's the Bible as it was written. He's a strict, uh, not constructionist, but a strict interpreter of the Bible, doesn't want to hear about science. Uh, science is the invention of the, of the devil. Now, in order for her to write this book, she had to research all this and did it really happen? And of course, it really did happen. So she, she her books are interesting to me because of the research she does. Uh, the one before that was flight behavior and it was really revolved around um, the migration of the monarch butterflies. But of course, the butterflies ended up in the wrong place. And so the people who were there, that's what the story revolves around, what they learned from this migration. And it's, it, her books are so interesting. Oh, I am so glad you're talking about research because that is a, a huge facet of writing that people have a tendency to, to kind of gloss over, especially if they're writing fiction. Oh, I, I get to make it all up. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're writing, if you're writing, you know, even if you're writing fantasy, you don't make it a lot. Absolutely. If you're writing fantasy, even if you're getting to build your own world, um, there are certain principles that have to be researched. And then you have to even research yourself, meaning you have to be consistent within that world mm -hmm. that um, if the laws of physics were suspended, then they must always be suspended in, unless there's a reason or something like that. Yeah, don't get rid of gravity. <laughs> really, really makes for a tough story if you get rid of <laughs> Or if you get rid of gravity, you have to remember to get rid of gravity all the time. And then when they just hold a cup of coffee, it has to also react the same way. And these are great, great things for people who are writing. Um, so, some, some takeaways we've, you've mentioned, look at the world, look at your life. You know, the, there are ideas everywhere. It's not like uh, Linda gets all the ideas and you don't get any of the ideas. Your, your whole existence is part of the ideas. Look at what you love but also look at what is marketable because we do want an eye on readers. And that, and that brings me to marketing. That is such a hard thing mm -hmm. for um, writers to reach readers. And essentially marketing is communication. It's, it's trying to get your readers or future readers to know about your book. I know you do a lot of uh, work and in interviews on what makes people you know, pick a book off of a shelf or off of a screen? How do we get people to want our books? Yeah, well, first of all, you have to get the book in the marketplace. Yeah. And that's why so many people put their books on Amazon. But I think that Amazon is, um, there's so much competition. You are competing with millions of books. So you really have to look at something else. And my advice to someone who's just starting or maybe even 
you know, they've been writing for a while is before the book comes out, you should advertise it. Mm. Get it on Facebook. I mean, I don't know how long Facebook is going to exist the way things are going. But, <laughs> but get it, you know, you can you can make a very simple uh, website for free almost and um, get it out there. Get Have a blog. There are a million places you can put blogs where you can put the first chapter. I mean, my, one of my favorite authors is Diana Gabaldon. Mm. Now, if you go on Diana Gabaldon's website, on the right-hand side, she, she is just finally releasing the next book, mm -hmm. November 23rd. I've already ordered it. <laughs> she has little, little chapter head. They're not even chapter headings. So she's so clever. She's just little phrases. And you go on there and it's a snippet from the book or a snippet she wrote that she liked that may not end up in the book. But it, it, it keeps you interested in the book. So do those kinds of things before the book comes out, advertise, advertise, advertise. You have people like, you know, even Pinterest, you could put stuff on Pinterest. Absolutely. And so you, you have to make the internet your best friend, yes. which was very hard for me because I really, you know, I wasn't into technology. Now everything's technology and you, you kind of have to be in it. So exactly. That's one piece of advice. And, uh, and again, um, put, put a chapter out, mm -hmm. you know, a, a little teaser. Um, and, and uh, you know, writing to me um, on a regular basis, everybody will say, write every day, write a thousand words every day. I can't do that. I just can't do that. <laughs> but you have to devote some time each week to your writing project. It may not be the writing, but it might be the marketing part. And I think the marketing part, like for instance, what happened for me during COVID, because most of my book sales were at book fairs and school book fairs and, and then crafts fairs. And that, that's how I get out there. Uh, but I couldn't do that. Everything was closed down. And all of a sudden, my audiobooks took off. Mm. So, um, and they still are, they're still doing very well. So make sure that you also. When you publish your book, make an audio book. Um, put it out in all forms, ebook, audio book, and, and print. And research that. Find, find out how to do those things while you're writing. So you, you're writing over here and then you're marketing over here, you know, and you're and you're <clears throat> you're researching it. You have to find out how. And then, then you go to Stephanie Larkin because <laughs> and oh, all the ways that you could be successful. <laughs> Well, I, I love your advice to look at other authors, where, whether it's someone huge like Diana Gabaldon or other local authors, see what they are doing and emulate them. You know, yeah. other people have, have paved the way. If Diana Gabaldon is doing it, believe me, it works. So, you know, look at other, what other authors are doing for ideas. You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel no. You have to see somebody else's wheel and and build your own little world over here. So I love that. The other thing that you said that that I really want to kind of harp on for our our listeners is that you're speaking a lot locally. Now, yes, make sure that your book is available on all formats for people everywhere, but targeting schools book fairs, people that you know are going to be readers is such an important thing. Direct marketing, shall I say. Uh, sometimes people forget that and forget about exactly who their reader is. Uh, Linda, I have such a great sense with you that you know exactly who your target reader is and that you're trying to reach them both directly and with your you know, internet things and social media indirectly but at least you have a picture in your head. The people who like my book are, you know, the readers are say between fifth and eighth grade, but I also have adults who love to read my books because it's a simpler time and I appeal well to educators. You have a very clear picture of what in marketing speak they call your target market. And because you have a clear picture of that, your book descriptions, blogs, et cetera, focus on that. I'm not convinced that other people are as thoughtful as you are as to exactly who they want their reader to be. Well, I think that um, 
you know, I'm fortunate in that I do the TV show. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've been doing it now. In August, it'll be 10 years. Wow, 10 I've years. Heard, I can't believe it. And it's all on YouTube. And every author I speak to has something to offer as far as advice. I mean, they talk about their books, and that's very interesting. But they, I also want them to talk about how they market their books mm -hmm. and and all of the problems that they had to overcome because this is what authors are watching the show for right. they want information and so i've learned through that i learn just as much as they do i try to give them information but i get plenty of information from that and then also it's it was it's years now of doing these these crafts fairs uh, I do them all over Long Island and also um, the book events at schools. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you try to pick up something from each experience because that's the only way that you end up marketing the books. And I, I, I really, you know, I also ask the authors, what do you want out of your writing career? What is it that you want? Do you want fame and fortune? Uh, do you just want to get your story out there? Do you just want to see the book in your hand? Um, and what I want is I want people to enjoy the story that I wrote. And sometimes, you know, there's things that I think about doing that I haven't looked into. Like I love to find a magazine that would serialize my books. Mm. I think that would be a great way to tell those stories. So that's something that, you know, maybe I'm going to have to look into. Oh, goody, another project. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's what you have to understand that you you can publish that book. You can self-publish that book. Uh, you can do it on small press. Right. Um, maybe you'll be lucky enough to get the big one. But <clears throat> then, and even if you have a traditional publisher, you do your marketing. Absolutely, you do. Absolutely, you do. And, I'm so and, glad you mentioned other authors, both ones who have been on your show that you're learning from and that your viewers are learning from. And, and I'm fortunate that you're now here on my show and my viewers can learn from you. The author community is so supportive. Yes. Yes, they, I have found that there's not really that jealousy there's it's it's oh you're writing a book well you know let me see if i can help you they don't say it that way but you know you get involved in a conversation and, and you share absolutely and uh, you know whether you have a local author community or um, one of the I'll, I'll call it a pandemic positive one of the positives of everyone being online there are a million author groups on say facebook and such and they are so supportive and so helpful to other writers. Please, please, if you are trying to get your foot wet with, with writing, join an author community. They really, really want to be there for you. They are filled with ideas and inspiration and, and getting to learn from someone like Linda who's written seven books. She knows, she knows the deal. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's a huge thing. But I also love when you were talking about goals because I am so goal oriented and I always want people to figure out what their goal is when they're starting down this path because I want them to feel success. Yes. And, and, and fame and fortune probably not as a great goal for first time writers, but. You know, uh, set a realistic goal. And the realistic goal is to finish writing the book, to yes. get the book edited. And that's another thing is get a professional editor. Yes. And the, the next goal is to get it published. Research how you want to have it published. I mean, I don't know. You probably can self-publish and send out, you know, to publishing houses at the same time. Yeah. Um, what's your goal? I mean, I was, I was already retired when I got into this stuff. So for me, it was, uh, I don't have, you know, I don't have 40 years ahead of me to, to do this. So that's why I self-published. And, and it's been an interesting journey. I cannot say that it was a disappointing journey right. because I met a lot of great people. Um, I sold books. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was, you know, it was different. It was very different from what I was used to doing. Fantastic. Um, you know, this is something that for me at this stage of my life is, is doable. I mean, I used to after I retired from public school, I, I taught at Hofstra 
I did consulting work and I taught for a very short time in a girls Catholic school. And it was, it was wearing. Mm. Teaching is hard work. Yeah, it is. And even now I do my lecture series and topics in forensic science. And now I'm doing them by Zoom. And I, I, I like it because I could sit at my desk. Mm -hmm. I don't have to try to find the place, the venue, and then, uh, you know, and, and stand for a couple of hours. Uh, but I also dislike not having contact with the audience. Mm. I feel lost. I feel like I'm talking into a void. <laughs> right, right. No, I get that. I get that. So what is next on your writing hit parade? Are you working on anything right now? Um, I really think that I'm going to try a sequel to uh, Buccaneers. And the reason why I'm tackling that instead of the next Annie Tillery uh, is because they're short books. And right now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm setting a big goal because of the Annie Tillery books are um, two to 300 pages. And, uh, you know, there's, they're a lot more complicated somehow. Right. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see how this thing goes. But uh, I'm looking forward to the warm weather because I write all my books on my porch. Ah, <laughs> so um, fantastic. We'll, yeah, we'll I'm looking there. forward to it also. I can't wait to be outside. Well, just to remind all of our viewers where you can find Linda, uh, the Buccaneer St. Frederick Island is available um, certainly at Amazon and at online and offline retailers. So also on my website and and there's some beautiful artwork on my website it's it's just my name lindamariafrank.com fantastic lindamariafrank.com and there you can also find the other books the other six and the books that are coming linda you are always a joy and i'm so excited you. for you're like a trove of information also and inspiration and, and you also are the source. Well, my pleasure. I just surround myself with greatness. So thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> and happy writing. Good luck with the next books. And we'll get you back on here when the next one's released. Thank you so much, Stephanie.